Well, good afternoon, Hetty. Or perhaps I should say, good afternoon, Mrs. F. Ritter Shumway. As I've mentioned to you before, uh, as I approached retirement, the thought occurred to me that many individuals were passing from the life of the, of the Institute, individuals from the board, from the administration, and from the faculty. And it would be a shame if the recollections and reminiscences of all of these people were lost as they moved out of the life of RIT. So I know that you and your husband, Ritter, have been so active and so much interested in the Institute for many years. And I wonder when you happen to be first become interested in RIT. Well, when we moved to Rochester, uh, uh, Ritter began telling me a little about RIT. and. Um, his mother, when his mother would come to visit us, she always told me about the early days. She was one of the first people, I think, to take uh, home economics. Yeah. In the early days, it was more or less home economics and mostly just cooking. <laughs> That's right. But she was one of the early ones. And, uh, of course, she always said that her and her father, Frank Ritter, was one of the early founders one of the, of the founders, right. Institute. And... Uh, she always had a particular story to tell about it. Mm -hmm. So it goes back a long way then, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Many generations. Yeah. Um, has Ritter ever mentioned uh, interesting anecdotes uh, that he might have heard from uh, his side of the family? About? Well, um, I don't know that I can remember anecdotes. Uh, I think Ritter's better at remembering those than I am. There's only one story he ever tells that I can remember, so I'm not very good at anecdotes. But I I did hear the story of how Mr. Ritter became interested in setting up Mechanics Oh, Institute. I would be glad to hear that. It seems that uh, Mr. Ritter's first wife had a brother who was considerably younger than she was, and she had brought him up. And he came to them, and apparently he lived with Mr. and Mrs. Frank Ritter. Institute and uh, Elizabeth uh, Ritter, Mr. Ritter's uh, wife, well, didn't want to have her younger brother leave Rochester, so that was one of the reasons Mr. Frank Ritter got interested in setting up Mechanics Institute. He said we can have a school like that here in Rochester. Well, that, that's uh, very interesting because I've never heard that uh, side of the story. And Mr. Ritter, then Mr. Long. And they all got together yeah. and they, they decided that it was needed more than for one person, so for a lot of people. That's, that's the way it started. That's, the way it started. that's interesting. Well, now, you were uh, instrumental or certainly one of the early founders of the Women's Council. Yes, that's you? right. Mm -hmm. um, I've just been reading over some of the minutes because I knew you wanted to know mm -hmm. something about it. And uh, I can remember the first meeting, it was in the house that the Ellingsons lived for the down on and East said, Avenue, mm -hmm. and uh, several of the women, early women, got together and talked about it and decided to do it, and we appointed Mrs. Brackett Clark interim president, and then the second meeting uh, was uh, about a month later, and we really, nom the nominating committee came up, and she was the first, first president. First president, I see. Now, let's see, yourself and Mrs. Beebe, was Mrs. Mrs. Alex? Mrs. Beebe was the Beebe? second one. Yes. And I think I was the third. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who were some of the other women that were on the council originally? Were they uh, board members' wives? Uh? Yes, most of them were board members' mm -hmm. wives or women who were, uh, were actively interested. And I believe Mrs. Vanderbilt Webb had so, put some of the idea into uh, Marsha's, uh, uh, talked to Marsha yes. about it, and uh, Mrs. Bradley talked. I believe Mrs. Webb had uh, been on some uh, the similar organization in New York. I expect that was the reason, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And the Women's Council, I think, has done a lot um, over the years. Well, as a male chauvinist standing off at one side, it seems to me it's made some excellent contributions. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let's see, you said that uh, that's Ruth Clark, Mrs. Brackett Ruth Clark, Clark, yes. Was the first president. Then uh, uh, Mrs. Alexander Beebe. Yes, let's was the see. second. And then you were the third one. Uh, what... Uh, what were some of the projects that you undertook? To well, when we were first started, uh, we felt that maybe we should help 
uh, with, with uh, doing some things for some of the students in a personal way. But after a couple of years, we decided that this was not necessary. The students had so much done to them and, and didn't have the time to take, and neither did the faculty have the time to give us to this. So uh, we began to do other things. We were originally set up with committees. Uh, one group worked with the art department and another with a different department. And we realized that money was needed as much as anything else. Not huge sums, because the Women's Council wasn't set up for that, but to use for special projects. We have always supported giving the library money, and uh, just uh, last week, I think we voted another $500 to the library. Fine. And um, we've given some money for scholarships. We started out by having bridge parties, and that was a great way to interest women. Mm -hmm. And we'd have them at uh, different members' houses. I remember carrying around some of the chairs and the bridge tables. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, those were all interesting projects. Uh, it seemed to me, too, that the actual uh, intangible results have been fully as great as the tangible. I mean, the interesting, the prominent uh, women in the city of Rochester, in RIT. Yes, it, interesting women who didn't know much about RIT. I think, uh, I'll never forget, we had one meeting out at, um, I think it was a fashion show, out at RIT at, in the new campus, and I invited some of my uh, uh, Twig friends and other people out, and some of them had never even been out to the campus. And I think this is an important uh, function of the council. And of course, we did give um, all the appurtenances for Tarja Chapel. Oh yes, that was a marvelous contribution. Which uh, was a, it took quite a lot of thought, and of course it was all made by the staff mm -hmm. of the American Craft School. Yes, yes, there was a cross, as I remember it, that uh, didn't uh, uh, Bill Kaiser design and execute that. Uh, I, I either either Bill, yes, I guess it was Bill Kaiser yes, who did it. that. Yes. And then there was a, a chalice. Yes, the Hans Christensen did a great deal of the things for us. All most of the silver yes. work was done by him. And then there was a weaving for the was that for the Torah? Yeah, the weaving was for the back of the. You see that there is no chapel when they use the Engel Auditorium. Yes. And it's a beautiful piece of tapestry that you still. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, our recording seems to be going all right, even to the telephone. Uh, well, we were talking about the uh, the appurtenances to the chapel and the uh, the cross that uh, Bill uh, Kaiser designed and the chalice and the silver that Hans Christensen designed and then the uh, the tapestry that uh, Don Vinowski had with. That's right. He, yeah. did, he did the tapestry for us. Mm -hmm. Well, that has certainly been a marvelous addition to Ingle Auditorium and been widely used. Part of it, I think, is used sometimes uh, uh, I understand by from Father Erdl over in some of the uh, dormitory areas oh. for special small mm -hmm. services. Good. Well, I'm glad it's uh, receiving so much use. Yes, oh so my. Fine. Yes. Uh, what are some of the impacts that you feel the council has made on RIT and on the Rochester community? Well, I think uh, one thing that it has done is that it's um, made the women in the community knowledgeable about RIT. I think RIT is a school that fundamentally interests m many of the men, uh, although they've had many courses that appeal to women over the yeah. years. Uh, but I think it's just today it's just as important for the women to know what goes mm -hmm. on as it is for the men. You know, it seems to me, uh, Petty, not being an old Rochesterian, but as I've read the history of Mechanics Institute, going back to the founding, that at that time, some of the leading women in the community were very much interested. You mentioned uh, Ritter's... Uh, well, yes, like mother, Ritter's mother. Ritter's mother. Of course, Ritter's mother was one of the most outstanding women because she was president of the Ritter Company for several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, in those days, that was very unusual. Was very unusual, yes. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, I think Mrs. Andrews, wasn't this Ezra Hale's... Uh, mother or some relative or I don't some know relative. and others I'm, in the early days were interested and then this interest 
and the part of the outstanding one in the community seemed to taper off a little bit during the, oh, maybe the World War I to World War II period, something like that. And I think the Women's Council has done a marvelous job of bringing back the attention of the Institute to these uh, women. I think it has, and I think particularly Margie Fitch has been a wonderful president. Yes, she's dynamically she interested, is. isn't she? Mm -hmm. And uh, she's uh, livened it up with a, brought in a lot of the younger women. Yes. And I think um, we're, we're going to keep on trying to get more of the younger women involved because yes. they're the ones that have the time. The time, sure. And the energy. Carrying on, sure. Well, that's marvelous. Well, now, uh, you've done so many wonderful things for the Institute. I think it's well recognized that you were the one that first heard about NTID. Would you want to just relate that? I, I think that would be I'd very be glad to tell you about okay. that because it happened right in this room where I first got interested. The Rock, uh, the, I've been interested in the deaf, as you know, for yeah. many years and have been on the board of the Rochester School for the Deaf since the early 40s. And uh, we were looking for a new superintendent for the Rochester School for the Deaf. And among some of the candidates was a young man named Dr. Ralph Pohl, who had, at that time was working for HEW. And one of the jobs that he was given was to write up the requirements for a technical institute for the deaf. So, uh, but he had had enough government experience uh, exposure at this time and felt he wanted to leave government service and come back to teaching of the deaf in a more personal way. So Ralph was looking for a school and he came up. I invited him, he and his wife, to come up and we had entertained them here. And after everybody else left, um, we were sitting in this room and uh, I said to him, I'd like to know more about what you were doing and, you know, trying to learn more about him. After all, we were thinking of having him head the school. So he was started telling me what he was doing at, at uh, HEW and about the plans and different things about it. And I said to him, you know, I think we've got just the place for that school. Now, by this time, the, the law had been passed that establishing NTID, I mean, authorizing NTID. I'm not exactly sure of the dates of when the mm -hmm. law got in. I, I could look that oh, up. Well, but, I, uh, uh, seems to me it's about 1965. But, uh, I think it President was. Johnson signed the. Uh, I have it all upstairs. Yeah, I didn't think to get all. I could do it later if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think probably the law had been passed, and RIT had already decided to move out to the new campus, yes. and they had that little hut up there, <laughs> and had done a little work out there, and I said, well. I, you know they're going to have a new campus and everything. I think this is the most perfect place for it. And I said, on the way to, to tomorrow morning, going to the airport, I'll take you by. <laughs> <laughs> so I drove around, and of course it was just very rough. Pretty wild. But I, then, when I drove around that square, and I said, this is all going to be the property. And we've got all the new buildings going up and everything. And I said, and what would we do uh, if we are interested in it? He said, well, you could write me or telephone me, and I will send the proper papers and everything, and they told me a little bit about what had to be done. But I said, I don't know at all whether RIT is interested, but maybe you'll be hearing from us. So uh, I put them on the plane, and they went off. And a few days later, I called uh, Mark Ellingson and asked if I could come down in his office that I had something to talk to him about. So I went down and told him something about it, and he said, well, who is this young man? I told him. He said, where can I get hold of him? He said, he said, an H-E-W. Well, he said, let's call him right now. And while I sat in his office, he called down and talked to Ralph and asked for the papers and wanted to know when, to, who to get in touch with and, and uh, so on. So that was... That was the genesis, genesis of this. <laughs> well, that's marvelous. And it's interesting the way those things from a, just a simple thought in the beginning grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, well now, as I have heard it and as I sat in on some of the meetings, it seemed to me there were quite a few schools that were interested in NTI. Oh yes, yeah, there were over 20 schools mm -hmm. in the country. And uh, some of the professionals uh, who helped the Senate write up the uh, um, 
the actual laws, um, wanted it to go to a couple of other schools, among which was the University of Chicago and, and the University of Pennsylvania and the school in Pittsburgh because they thought they had some classes in educating teachers for the deaf, and they had some interest in it. But thank goodness the committee. <laughs> well, as I remember it, they narrowed it down to about four schools. Then there wasn't there a visiting committee? Oh, yes, the visiting committee came here. And uh, they, they came to all the schools. They went to all mm -hmm. the schools, and they apparently they came several times. Yes. And the decision was finally made. Finally made to come here, and, and then we hired the architect, one of the architects who'd done the work on the new campus. Yes. Hugh Cumming, Hugh Stebbins. Hugh Stebbins, yes. Now, uh, when uh, when was uh, Dr. Robert Fazino, the present director, employed? He must have been employed fairly early, wasn't he? He was employed, I think, about a year after that, I, I could look up the dates. Mm. I'm sorry, I have. All, I didn't realize you needed well, quite all no, that. That's a, it's an immaterial. He was appointed very early, and I was very delighted that he was because I've known known Bob Brzezina. I knew him before through the school, uh, Rochester School for the Dead. I see. Now he had been, as I remember, dean of the graduate school at Gallaudet. That's right. And uh, he came from that, so he'd had a long background in working with the dead. Yes, he had. And it certainly was a marvelous choice, wasn't it? Oh, he's been a fantastic yes. choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and he's brought some excellent people here with him. That's right. Well, he has brought uh, marvelous faculty and have been doing some interesting work. Then the first class of a very few students, as I remember, entered about 1968. Ten That's or right. fifteen or twenty, possibly, young deaf students entered uh, that fall. Yes, they did. And uh, it was with considerable enthusiasm, but also I think some apprehension. Yes, I know, Leo. You didn't think much of the idea. <laughs> I had some real reservations in the beginning, but uh, certainly those have all disappeared, and uh, they uh, have made great contribution to the institute. I think they have. And the, uh, work that they've done, I think, has been, uh, well, I think it's reacted both ways. I think that it's been wholesome as far as the RIT student body is concerned, and I think that the RIT student body is probably good for the, uh, the NTID student body. I think it's very important, having uh, worked with the deaf uh, for many years, or for the deaf, and trying to help them, I realize that their problem is is considerably greater even than we think it is. Recently, I've had, I don't know whether you want this, I've had the opportunity of working with some older deaf people, and uh, we think even with finger spelling that we're getting everything across, but we're not. And we don't realize, particularly those who are born deaf, that they, it's a miracle that they get anything. The more I work with the deaf, the more I realize that their handicap is probably the greatest handicap. Maybe even more than a blind person. Oh, much more than a yeah. blind person, because if you can't communicate, yeah. it makes it very hard. And we say so much by the intonations of our voice. We say, oh yeah? Well, that means different than this, oh yes. <laughs> because uh, there are these intonations and inflections that uh, that person just never gets. They never get them. And uh, so much of our communication is that, uh, is that way. Um, Getting back to the National Advisory Group, now, who were some of the people on the advisory group in the beginning? It seems to me we had a very widely representative uh, group of outstanding people. Well, we did have, we've had uh, a great number of interesting people. I think one of the outstanding people on the advisory group was uh, uh, Mrs. Homer Thornberry. Oh, yes, from, from Texas. Uh, Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. who has been interested in the deaf for many years, who's on the Gallaudet board. She was on the, the committee that came, the evaluating mm -hmm. committee. Of course, Mr. Sil Dr. Silverman was also on the evaluating committee. He was not on the National Advisory Group, but he was on the, yes. one of the, co the committee that helped pick uh, RIT. Um, Dr. The head of the Clark School, 
uh, was on, on the committee. One of the early problems uh, when we first started um, the NTID was the problem of fingerspelling versus sign and, and verbal versus um, and the speech problem. And we had s several people who very much were not in favor of fingerspelling. But I think many of them have, have realized the, that you've got to use every form of communication to help the deaf, and that is why NTID uses, uses, fingerspelling. uses fingerspelling. Along with and all other sign language, sign language and language. everything. And um, they're doing some fantastic things as well. Now, uh, Dr. Ralph W. Tyler is on it, wasn't he? Yes, not? he was the chairman for many years, and he he really helped bring the NAG um, along and helped uh, with the whole problem yes. of the building and everything else. Now, let's see, there was one chap from IBM. Yes, we've had several chaps from IBM. Uh, we had... Um, um, John Opel is on the from IBM at the present time, and uh, Gus Raffy is the Raffey, man. He, he then did. later he moved to Texas. Oh, he did. I didn't yes, realize he's that. he's living in Texas now. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had uh, uh, the man who now is heads the, the Hartford School, Ben. Um, he had been in North Carolina, had he not? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I, I can't remember his last name. Then wasn't there a uh, gentleman from uh, Illinois, he and his wife. Mr. Orman. Mr. Orman, that's Orman. right. Yes. And then we had a man from, you're better than I am. Well, I can remember some because I had the uh, privilege of attending some of the meetings. Oh, yes. I, we missed and you after you stopped coming. You know, we now have, as the chairman, we had a wonderful man named Sanderson who heads up um, rehabilitation for the state of um, Utah, mm -hmm. and uh, Bob Sanderson was our president for a couple of years, but uh, we changed again this year, and we have the, one of the first graduates of NTID as oh, our president, so? oh, for heaven's Kevin sake. Nolan. Well, that's amazing. Oh, he must be quite young, isn't he? Yes, he's quite young. He's had two jobs since he left. He's now back in the Boston area, and uh, he, and his, he was married since, and he has a little boy, mm -hmm. about a year and a half old, For heaven's sake. and he's doing a fabulous job. He's president of the, he's National, president Advisory of the National Advisory. Well, that's amazing. We thought this would be good for the everybody. Surely. Uh, what were some of the problems, as I remember, even after the school had been definitely established at RIT, there was much uh, feeling, I think, on the part of certain individuals in Washington that it still shouldn't be at RIT. And uh, I had the feeling that there was a lot of undercurrent uh, there that was uh, going on. Was there was of... quite a lot of undercurrent going on. Uh, again, there's always going to be with the deaf, I think, this feeling. Part of it's because of the use of, um, of uh, many people don't believe in any kind of hand spelling. They don't realize how they handicap again. It's a double handicap. And uh, <coughs> then there were some other, there were some jealousies that, because, uh, uh, but I think most of that is ironed out. Many of the people who uh, had some doubts all came to the dedication a year and a half ago. Yes. And I think many, there was great respect for what Bob Fuzina and, and, and our IG had done. Yes. Yes, and that was a very impressive affair, the uh, dedication. Uh, it was. Paul, and of course, Mrs. Uh, Johnson, President Johnson's widow, was there. Yes. And uh, I thought spoke very feelingly and uh, uh, with great sincerity. I think she did. Yes, that was marvelous. Uh, how do you feel that the, the realities have measured up to the expectations of NPID? I think in many ways they've uh, far, uh, they've far out, I mean, they've done a better job than anybody thought they would do. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot still to be done. I, I think, um, 
I think we've got to, and, and so part of this is, is not due to the NTID, it's due to our schools for the deaf uh, with the younger children. I think uh, I have seen the tremendous difference in the Rochester School for the Deaf since the NTID has come, in, come here. We're beginning to realize our young people have got to get be pushed out. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, schools for the deaf, uh, even in the 40s, where the children came and stayed there, and uh, the parents were glad to put them off. Now, I, I know at Rochester School for the Deaf, we make all our children go home every single weekend. We have only about 40% uh, of the children, or maybe even 35, and eventually we'll we won't have to have that many live in, but they live in only, they come on Sunday night and they go on Friday afternoon. This is a tremendous change. Also, we, we bring in more children, and this needs to be done in every school throughout the country before they come here. And I think this is one reason why we have to have the vestibule program, which yes. is the summer program, to get them used to being away from their parents, away from their home, and out on their own. Yes, I suppose this is quite a shock for some of the young people because some of them have probably lived rather protected lives. They have, and we and we, many of us have protected them too much, too. Yes. Uh, we're almost to the end of this side of the tape, and we we'll turn it over. How do you feel that the uh, you feel that the deaf community at large throughout the country has been fairly well satisfied with the with the uh, results so far of NTID? I think on the whole they have. I think one of the most outstanding records is the record of uh, employment for right. our students. Uh, that's up in the 90 percent, Kyle. And of course, um, I think this is something that even uh, that RIT has helped with. I think one of the great reasons why NTID should have come here to RIT was because of the of the program of, of work and, and uh, schooling, the cooperative, the work, cooperative program. work program, mm -hmm. and this has been a great benefit to the NTID students. I think the the concept of a vestibule program, then a diploma program, then an associate degree program, and baccalaureate for a certain percentage, is an excellent idea that they can go on as far as their capabilities uh, enable them to. Yes. Uh, it is great, and uh, I know um, one of our um, young graduates is a, in the ma getting a master's degree in art. Is that so? Yes, so and he's had, it's the young Benke boy. His mm -hmm. father was on the NAG mm -hmm. for a while, and uh, Nat Benke had also, he won uh, one of the awards at the Memorial Art Gallery last year for outstanding work. He's, he's, going, to, he's going places, and uh, okay. this is due to... Uh, is being a student in NTID and getting the benefits of this art school and uh, this is fantastic for these kids. I'm always afraid that we'll be re we'll not be recording at the end of the tape or we're running down just about to the, the end of it and I think I'll turn it over right now. Well we're back on the air again now. Uh, as you think back over the original selection of RIT as the school for MTID was to be established, what do you feel were some of the factors that resulted in the institute being chosen? Well, I think one of the things was the community itself. Rochester is a very unique community. It has high-skilled workers, and uh, they have, on the whole, been very good to the deaf. Eastman Kodak Company, Lawyers Cooperative, uh, Xerox, Cybron. Cybron, many of the companies have had uh, the deaf and, and handicapped uh, people working there, and I think this was important. Another thing is the cooperative program at RIT, which is, is one of the greatest things about it, I think. It gives a young person the opportunity to learn and work at the same time, and then when he gets through, he has some idea of what, what the world works all about. Works all about. <laughs> yeah. and then, of course, uh, we had a wide variety of technical programs. Yes, this is very important. And, uh, 
and the art school is there, and many of the deaf have great creative ability. I can remember many years ago, one of the top graduates of Rochester School for the Deaf um, matriculated in the art school. Later she began teaching art. She went down to a Gallaudet College, which is a, a liberal arts college for the deaf in Washington. And uh, today she's married. <laughs> I don't know what she's teaching. <laughs> teaching her children, maybe. Uh, well, I suppose another factor might have been that uh, the Institute was fairly flexible. We offered uh, not only a wide variety of programs, but we offered associate degree programs and offered baccalaureate degree programs. And of course, as uh, Dr. Ellingson used to refer to it as a shirt sleeve university, mm -hmm. which bothered some of the faculty. But, <laughs> uh, but was that a significant factor? I think that was a very significant factor because many of the deaf, uh, not that they don't have uh, the brains, but they they don't get as much. Some of them uh, can uh, communicate better than others. And I think this is terribly important. So that's been one uh, good thing about this vestibule program they've had in the summer. Have the young people come in for oh, eight about uh, four to six weeks? And they get an intense uh, communications uh, program, do they not? Yes. And that sort of brings them up to a certain minimum level, at least. Yes, you see, and, and many of them go to just just uh, speech schools where there's no English spelling at all and vice versa. So they all have to learn the communications of the other persons. Now, I think this is uh, one thing that's uh, <laughs> confusing to many of us. You speak of the finger spelling, then you speak of signing, and then you speak of lip reading. Yes. Now, uh, they're not mutually exclusive, are they? No, they're not mutually exclusive, but um, there is a difference. In, in some schools use much more sign language and others use finger spelling. For example, at the Rochester School for the Deaf, we use lip reading and uh, finger spelling. Now, the advantage of finger spelling is that there's a, a sign for every letter, mm -hmm. and they learn their spelling, they learn their reading, and they in a far better way than with just uh, uh, sign language. Sign language is, is made up of lots of the signs. Some of them even use them to uh, make up their own signs. It's sort of a shorthand, it's isn't it? It's a shorthand. It's, yeah. it's like a shorthand. And different, even different parts of the country use a little bit different mm -hmm. uh, um, sign language. Now, we at Rochester School for the Deaf try to get our children to do only finger spelling up to a certain age level. We know they use sign language. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily stop it, but we want them to get their English yeah. and their spelling and the basics so that they can really read and understand. But from what you say, then, it, it's true that as these young people come in at the beginning of this vestibule program, they come in from a whole variety of backgrounds. Yes. Some may have had nothing but finger spelling, some nothing but lip reading. And uh, so they're brought together then in this the vestibule program. Yes, that's right. That's the reason it's important. We require them to come to the vestibule program. Yeah. And uh, then from that, in the fall, they enter into the, the diploma programs, and some of them are short uh, duration, and others are two or three years. Well, most all of them stay at least two years, mm -hmm. I think. And We've had many graduates, I can't tell you the exact number, with a BA degree, and we do have a few who are going on to masters. And um, it's quite exciting to see them doing some of the, the kinds of the work that they're doing, especially in uh, chemistry and some of these yes. things. Now, is there any uh, uh, law or anything in the law that established the uh, NTID that says they should only go so far Oh, this has been one. This is one of the things that has brought a lot of controversy uh, about, and um, I think uh, at the present time that uh, one of the things uh, when NTID was originally founded, the federal government was going to pay for every student, and later they decided that they Gallaudet College did not do that. So they decided that uh, 
this would not happen. But what? But most of them are paid for by vocational rehabilitation in, in the their state. own states, their own it's state. by the states. Uh, there are probably a few pay parents that can't afford to pay for them, but they are not very many. And uh, this is not a criteria. But then they're allowed to go for the associate and then on to the baccalaureate if they have Oh, yes, they can all go as far as the baccalaureate, and I believe they can even get graduate programs. I see. And the federal government, all the vocational education <laughs> will pay uh, for that. Yes. So that's, uh, that's good. Uh, we fought for this. <laughs> yes, it would be unfortunate if there were some brilliant young people that uh, were not allowed to go on. Oh, it would be very unfortunate. Now, with the opening of the new NTID complex, which is beautiful, uh, do you feel or have you heard any reverberations as to whether the uh, student bodies seem to be uh, less integrated or separated more than they were before the new complex was completed? Well, I think there's some feeling. I think um, I think there is some feeling, although uh, there has been intermingling. We, we never uh, intended it just to be for NTID students, because um, part of their development is mixing with, with hearing students. Um, I think uh, the RIT students have been wonderful. Many of them have taken uh, special courses in fingerspelling and sign language, and they have uh, also become um, note takers uh, at, at classes yes. to help the students, and uh, they have done an outstanding job, and some of them are resident advisors in the house, and um, this all makes it, I think some of the students feel that they're not quite as integrated as they should be with the new buildings, but I think that's going to take a little time. We, At the present time, they do require freshmen to stay in the dormitories. And I think this is important because they come from such different backgrounds and they come from Hawaii, they come from uh, Alaska, they come from all, all over. over. Almost all of the 50 states now. Almost. I think, yeah. we, I think it's up in the 40s. Have they admitted any foreign Dutch students at all? No, not at the present time. And I think this will have to take a lot of thinking because yes. it is a federal program. I, yes. We've had a great many farm uh, visitors, visitors mm -hmm. from around the world come here, um, and they come to NTID and they come to some of our local schools. Mm -hmm. And um, again, uh, this uh, interestingly enough, I have seen some of the books that they use for sign language and they. They're a little different from ours, yes. so it's, there's a lot to be learned. Yes. It would be, you would add one more problem, it wouldn't would. it? Yes. Uh, well, Hetty, as I remember, the original uh, concept was to have the student body build up to a maximum of about 750. That was right. Uh, I think it is 750, and I, I, have, I have a figure in my mind of 1,000 maybe allowing for, not necessarily building quarters for them, but um, there will always be some flexibility, in, in the, certainly in the classes. I mean, there'll be maybe a few more students in one year than another. Yeah. Like it may be 750 full-time, which might mean that you could have up to 1,000 or some of them were part-time. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I've noticed, uh, not knowing much about the deaf students, particularly the younger ones, it seemed to me that they're a fairly happy group. Deaf students are very happy, can be very happy. They mix a lot with their own. Mm -hmm. They're very shy, and maybe this is some of our problems with them. The older deaf is, is very much the same way, but they seem to be very happy. And they do, they, there's a close camaraderie very within close the camaraderie. deaf group, and the, uh, the fellows and the girls uh, don't seem to pay quite so much attention to appearance of the other fellow, as maybe the hearing students do. Mm -hmm. That uh, whether uh, whether the girl's a little roly-poly or whether the fellow's not quite so good-looking, they're still very friendly. Yes, they're very friendly. And, uh, they communicate in their way very well. Uh, well, as you look 
down the road a ways what you think is the future of NTID and its impact on RIT and RIT's impact on NTID. Well, as long as, as there are deaf students, there, of course, we'll need NTID. Um, many things are being done in this country to prevent students being born deaf today. Um, but I'm a, uh, and we've, we've gotten rid of many diseases that uh, brought the early deafness into, into the um, world. But uh, I think it's a lot has been done in this community, particularly by NTID and RIT. Being here, the fact that it is here, means that we've got a greater problem in the community. It's making many people realize that uh, we've got to be thinking of the older deaf person. And uh, this is, it, it isn't easy always to do this. And there are many different kinds of older deaf people. There's some who've been deaf for years, and that, then there are others who have gotten deaf later on, who may sit in a room by themselves, not knowing how to communicate. And interestingly enough, some of our deaf students are being volunteers in the community. Oh, that's good. And I know of a, some of them, but we've had a couple in the volunteer services at Strong. I know that some of them have gone to visit some older deaf people and try to help them a little bit. And uh, so um, there's a, we're much more thinking of the deaf person today. We're trying to get the police to understand uh, the, deaf people, problem, yeah. the problem of deafness. There needs to be more. I was talking the other day with somebody at Spur Memorial Hospital. There's always somebody up there who can communicate with yeah. them. Recently, Ellen Wolf, who's now out at, um, at um, RIT, she's in the health services, not just for NTID, but she's in the health services. Okay. And she's a nurse practitioner, and she's done a lot. Good. Mm -hmm. It's been of interest to me how many of uh, our friends here in Rochester have been greatly impressed by the fact that NTID is on the RIT campus. They have felt that this has really been a great contribution on the part of RIT. It is a great contribution on the part of our it's, uh, it's the community, the friends that we have in the Rochester community have reacted very positively to it. Good. And uh, very much uh, impressed, very much interested. I tell you what's really taken over, and that's the theater. Yes. Out there, the young people have come from different places I've been in and done some of their theater, and people are so enthusiastic. Yes, they've done a marvelous job. Yeah. That's true. Well, Hetty, uh, do you have any other reflections or reminiscences uh, that you might uh, want to get on tape here, either about NTID or about RIT? Well, I think the more I've seen of RIT, the more enthusiastic I get <laughs> about it. It's been, I'm just very grateful that I was allowed to be on the board during, during the move and during all the excitement. Yeah. RIT and NTID. I'm grateful that they let me stay on the energy. <laughs> and um, I, I, although I'm an honorary member of the board, I still go to all, most of the sure. meetings, and I'm on uh, on the uh, committee that is interested in student services, just as I've been from the beginning. This is my greatest interest. And um, I just hated to meet, miss a meeting last week. I was in Washington. <laughs> on residences, because I think this, this is so important. This is where the students in the mingle, yes. the deaf and hearing students, and how they get along is so important. So much of the education goes on there. Yes, the, not in the classroom. No, but, but in the residence hall. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly it wouldn't be complete if uh, we didn't say the marvelous contributions that you and Ritter have made to RIT oh. uh, right down through the years. thousands of hours of time and energy that both of you spent. Just fantastic. Well, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's uh, certainly evidenced by all that you've done. And I really appreciate this. And as I say, this uh, tape will be put in the archives. And uh, you can be able to listen to it and oh find out a little bit more about uh, NTID mm -hmm. and uh, Ritter's contributions and your contributions to NTID and to the Institute. So thanks very much. Well, you're welcome. My pleasure.